be seated. Welcome to Back to Church Sunday. Amen. Amen. We're so glad that we have Back to Church Sunday today, and God's just blessing us. And we're so glad you're here to have that day with us and just be rejoicing uh, with the Lord and to the Lord of all that He's done. Uh, we welcome our first of all our first time guests with us this morning. We welcome you here to Believers Fellowship. And we're so glad you're here with us. And uh, as you came in, you should have uh, got a card from the Welcome Center, a little connection card. If you take that uh, information there and just write down uh, uh, your name and all the information that's on that card. And also put down any way we can be praying for you or ministering to you or let us know a way we minister to you or your family. And we consider that an honor and a privilege to do that for you and to be able to uh, minister to you that way. So. <laughs> anyway, but we again welcome you and just hold on to that card and at the end of the service we'll tell you how to take it down to the lobby and we have a, a gift that we want to give you for being our very special guest. So uh, we're going to have a welcome time and uh, when we do this welcome time, if we could kind of bring the crowd from this way into that way and this way into that way as we have more people come in, they can fill up on the edges. So during our welcome time, if you can do that, we would very much appreciate it. So what we'd like to do now, if you are a very first time guest here at Believers Fellowship, we'd like to ask you just to remain seated right where you are. And members, regular attenders, find the row behind you if you would, the row ahead of you, and people beside you, and welcome everybody to our congregation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Heart becomes free 
really exciting. We got to, uh, over by the Children's Church, just went in there, and there was a, about a oh, ton of little kids sitting in there, just worshiping right along with you, praising the Lord, they're watching the same uh, broadcast, being sent from here over there, so that's pretty cool, and go downstairs, there's 15, 20 people down there, worshiping, you guys downstairs in those other areas, thank you for your patience. In fact, thank all of you for your patience as we go through this process of getting things uh, redone. And apparently, the Lord sent Harvey in here to tell us we need to clean house and repaint. <laughs> I always thought we were saying repent. I'm sorry. <laughs> but uh, I think we need to do both. Uh, so be patient. Probably one more week up here and scattered out the way we're scattered out everywhere. Appreciate those who've gone over to the other campus there to kind of give us a little more breathing room in here as well. Appreciate you cycling in and out there as, as needed. And so... It's a blessing, uh, but uh, we, it's getting a little tight in here in some places, amen? <laughs> Especially for you folks, that, I know you want to sit in the front row, we saved you four seats, but uh, we'll find you wherever you are in, in the building, amen? But we are glad that you're putting up with the, 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 all the stuff that's going on, and appreciate it, can't say thank you enough for that. Uh, there are just probably one or two more big work days that we will call. It takes a lot of work just to get the lobby cleaned out after all the construction dust each week. For those who are coming on Saturdays and done that last bit of work for us, I can't pat you on the back enough and say thank you enough each time you've done that. It's made all the difference in the world. But hallelujah, you give them a praise of uh, Painters have finished painting in that area, all except the doors, because the doors are <coughs> going to have to all be replaced. I bet that's not my water. <laughs> Does anybody have a water they can bring me from over there or something? I appreciate it. But anyway... Uh, there's a, that, that's about finalized in there. The carpet comes in on Tuesday. Uh, we had remodeled the stage uh, after many complaints about almost falling off the stage with the stairwells the way they are. So we remodeled the stage the way you'll enter on and stuff and redid the stairwells so, thanks, uh, so that uh, nobody will be falling off the stage anymore. I think my wife is the only one who's done that so far, but... Uh, <laughs> That's right. She won't, file, she won't file a lawsuit, so that's okay. We'll, we'll be all right. But kind of thing, trying to improve things as we go. We're taking down all those warehouse lights that were in there. We put in LED lighting. So while we're in the midst of all this, we're, we're trying to improve some things as well as we go along. So I uh, had a power bar between services and it's stuck in my throat. I know that's too much information. We've been talking about revival. I want to continue with that today, and I think it's appropriate for what we're going through, because as we talk about this particular story today, uh, it was a time of revival for the nation of Israel. Uh, preceding that, like as with most great moves and awakenings of the Spirit of God, there was also a time of terrible uh, crisis spiritually. In fact, it's gotten so bad that God says that's enough, and he sent a drought into the land. And if you're familiar with the first kings and the story of Elijah, which you know, if you've been in church at all, you're familiar with those, those stories. Now that uh, Elijah has gone into the king's palace and declared that it's not going to rain anymore until he gives the word. And, of course, he's only operating according to what the Holy Spirit tells him, what God directs him to do. So you see this man who's this prophet of God moving in accordance with the word of God and the will of God, which is one of the fascinating things as you study the character of Elijah. And many years ago, we did, like I think, a 22-part sermon series on Elijah as we walked through his life. So how God used him in great matters. But this is a time where we're, we're, there's a crisis going on. It's gotten so bad as we open the Word of God in a moment, the First Kings chapter 8 thing, you'll see that even the king himself is out looking for grass, grazing lands and water for the herds and for the horses and for the cattle. He doesn't really care much about the people, but he does care about the livestock because that's the money, all right? So he's watching out for the bank accounts, obviously, not much for the people. Because he's a wicked king, and he's pretty much a worthless individual. Uh, that's not judging, I'm just reading the Bible, what it says about him, all right? So, uh, it's a time when God moves. Now, the, the, there's a crisis moment, as always, when God moves, and even in our own lives, I really believe that we usually come to a crisis moment before we really just get surrendered before the Lord in our life and say, okay, God, have your way with us. And uh, this is where we're at in this particular nation as this, this story is taking place. We've talked about revival the last several weeks, how that is, that is a supernatural, extraordinary move of God in the hearts of God's people. When God begins to work in such a great way that people's hearts are tender and sensitive to the leadership of God in their life, people are coming to know Christ, people are spending more time with each other, with the Lord, with the fellowship of the saints. It's just a time where God just does a tremendous renewal work. There was a great revivalist and a great Bible preacher that preceded Billy Graham by the name of Billy Sunday. 
you're familiar with him. He was quite a preacher. He was a guy who walked and stomped and screamed and shouted, and God used him tremendously. But one lady came cynically up to him one, after one service. He said, okay, Mr. Sunday, why do you keep having revivals when it doesn't seem to last? They just last for a while. Of course, that's pretty much the same way in Scripture. You see these great revivals, and they kind of wane out. But his response was classic when he said, well, why do you keep taking baths? I'll just think about that for a moment. We take baths because we need a bath every once in a while. And every once in a while, we need a great move of God. And every once in a while, we need a great revival. Here we are in the midst of this moment in the first Kings where the people are, are in desperate. Uh, the king's men are out looking for water. There's a warrant out for Elijah. All right? It's like Interpol's looking for him. In every nation, they've been doing a search for him. And they haven't found him. There's a man in the story we'll look at by the name of Obadiah as well, who's a prophet of the Lord, but he's, you know, I'm not sure about Obadiah's commitment to the Lord, as you'll see in just a moment where, where he's at. Let's look at this passage about revival. I'm going to go right past that because we'll come back to those three points. It says that Ahab said to Obadiah, well, that's the king, go through the land to all the springs of water and to all the valleys, and perhaps we will find grass and keep the horses and the mules alive and not have to kill some of the cattle. So they divided the land between them to survey it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. Now, as Obadiah, can I back up one more? I think I passed that one right out. Could you back it up for me one slide? It says, Now, as Obadiah was on the way, behold, Elijah met him and recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is this you, Elijah, my master? And he said to him, It is I. Go, take, go say to your master, Behold, Elijah is here. And he said, Obadiah does, What sin have I committed? that you're giving your servant into the hand of Ahab to put me to death. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent to search for you. And when they said he's not here, he made that kingdom or nation swear to it they couldn't find you. And now you're saying to me, go say to your master, behold, Elijah's are here. He said, Behold, you know, it will come about that when I leave you, that the Spirit of the Lord will carry you where I do not know. So when I come and tell Ahab, and he came, I find you, he'll kill me. And although I, your servant, have feared the Lord for my youth, has it not been told to you, my master, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, that I hid a hundred prophets of the Lord, about fifties in a cave, I provided them with bread and water, and now you're saying to me, go say to you, that sound like a broken record, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Go say to your master, behold, Elijah said, he, he'll kill me. Man, get over yourself. And Elijah said, as the Lord lives before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. So Obadiah, reluctantly, went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And when Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, is this you, you troubler of Israel? And he said to him, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandment of the Lord, and you have followed the bells. Now then send and gather to me all of Israel, Mount Carmel, together with the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. Story ends with him basically calling for a showdown. It says, you bring all false prophets that eat at your table, those 850 pagan leaders, and you bring them with you and bring the nation with you, and I'll meet you on Mount Carmel, and we'll have a discussion about who we're going to serve at that particular point. Now, this is an interesting story, and there's probably multiple sermons, but I want to kind of put this and kind of encapsulate this in the context of real revival and what, what it takes and what is needed, because uh, it's important we understand what the essence or the is of revival. So I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the enemies of revival, and I want to talk about, at the end, what is the evidence that we're seeing revival. Let's talk about, first of all, the enemies of revival. Now, the first thing that comes to my mind is this enemy of compromise. And Obadiah here, this, this man who meets Elijah first, is a, is a good uh, uh, picture of what it means to be compromising in your spiritual walk in life. Here's a man who's been Obviously, he's concerned about the things of God, but he's still concerned about his own life. And he puts his interest, in, or it seemed to be always in conflict with the interest of God. In fact, there's a bit of arrogance, because when he's talking to Elijah, he says, Haven't you heard of me? Don't you know what I've done for God? You know, it's, it's the idea. But you can tell at the same time how concerned he is with his own skin. It's like, he, when you, if I go tell Elijah, you know, every time anybody's looked for you, they can't find you, and somebody says you're there, and you disappear. And this is what's happened for three years, because the Lord's been leading Elijah and keeping him safe 
while there's been this warrant out for his life and for his arrest. And so he's thinking, you know, if I go tell him, you're going to just disappear once again. And, and three times, he's going to kill me. 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 You know, like I said, it's almost like a broken record at points. But as he's moving along here, you see, obviously, something's wrong with this picture. Jezebel wants to kill all the prophets of God. Yet he serves in the house of Jezebel. And he's supposedly a prophet of God or a man of God. In fact, he's committed to this to some degree. He said, don't you know that when Jezebel started killing all you guys, that I hid the prophets out by 50s in caves? No. You know, I'm, I'm a good guy. Look at all I do for God. But there's obviously something missing in his life. I, by the way, I, I was thinking personally that when a, when, a, when a crisis breaks out and when the sin is so rampant in the nation and when the threat is so high, that's not the time to go into hiding. That's not the time to hide the prophets out of all people. Amen? You need a prophetic voice that's being preached in the land. But honestly, Obadiah, he reminds me of a lot of what goes on in the church today. There's a lot of people have this kind of a, I would say, an acknowledgement, an admiration of Jesus. You know, they admire the Lord. They're fond of the Lord. They'll say they love the Lord. They'll say they're disciples of Christ. But there's no real commitment. There's still that fear about what someone might do about them, think about them, say about them, respond about them. So they kind of, they live with, you know, they got their little light shining, but it's not shining very bright. And if it is lit, it's hid up under the bread or under a bushel somewhere, you know, up under the bed where, where, where it's, it's not being given, given any evidence. This is Obadiah. But Obadiah is a common picture, and I'll say not so much even as the church as it is of the pastors of churches today. Mm. I have a beef with pastors in America. This is a time when the American pulpit ought to be bold, it ought to be loud, it ought to be clear, it ought to be forthright, and it ought to be truth-telling. It shouldn't be a time when pastors are more concerned about political correctness and about what's popular, and about church growth. If we put as much money and attention in churches today on discipleship as we do church growth, it'd be amazing what God would do with this nation. The numbers attending might not be as great, but the effect upon this nation would be incredibly powerful. Amen. As people respond in love and walk with Jesus Christ. But Obadiah is one of those guys, you know, he's not going to, if he is speaking in a pulpit somewhere, he's not going to use that dirty word, sin. Or that other horrible, profane word, repent. Those aren't going to come across his mouth. They're not going to sound out of his voice. He's going to be very cautious in the way he parses his word so as not to offend anybody and so as not to affect the offering in a negative way. <laughs> Amen? Amen? It's going to be kind. It's going to be polite. It's going to be a big smile. It's always going to be God bless us, God bless you, God bless me, God bless everybody. You know, to always pronounce a blessing on everybody. To always, I want to pronounce God's favor on everybody. Now, all be warmed and filled. God bless you. God bless you. But then at the same time, there's no right. There's no, there's no truth. There's no light that's being shared. So we're living in a time, and I think that the pulpits and even Christians in America are living in a time of great compromise, such as they were here. And the word of God is not being sounded forth boldly. Andrew Murray made this great statement. He said, true revival means nothing less than a revolution. Casting out the spirit of worldliness in our heart. It is the main thing in our lives, in other words. And if we choose to live that way, we will be revolutionary. We will not care what the world thinks, says, does, how they behave, how they act toward us, or what kind of press might come out in the evening on us. We're just going to be people of the truth and hold to truth. The Bible says, unfortunately, in the last days, it won't be like that. The people will hold to a form of godliness, like Obadiah here, but they'll deny the power of it. Right. We don't need somebody else, you know, getting up and making nice, sweet-smelling speeches. We need somebody just going to get up and speak truth today. Compromise is killing us. Webster's Dictionary uses this definition of compromise. It's a mutual agreement to refer matters in dispute to the decision of arbitrators. A settlement by arbitration, by mutual consent, reached by concession on both sides a reciprocal abatement of extreme demands of rights resulting in an agreement basically yield upon compromise. It is a committal to something derogatory or objectionable, a prejudicial concession, a surrender, a compromise of character or a compromise of right. The last thing that churches in America need to be doing in times of crisis is compromising character. Are saying, well, we won't do this if you won't do that, and we won't say this if they won't say that, and we're just trying to make everybody happy. Mm -hmm. I, this, this is not a time. Yeah. When we're in such a national crisis as we are, and I'm not even talking about Harvey or Ermy or any of those other little storms, you know? 
I'm talking about the problem that we're facing of moral deterioration in our nation where sin is rampant and people have become so, so absent-minded regarding God and the things of God that we've lost sight of what heaven is and what God desire is and what God's word means. It's compromise. Now, with compromise, it's kind of like dominoes, comes corruption. Ahab and Jezebel, it doesn't take a genius or a theologian to read that story much longer and say, hey, they're a bunch of pagans. These are some wicked people. Not only are they pagans and are they wicked people, they, they have 850 pagan preachers on the payroll. They come and eat dinner with them every night. I'm sure they pronounce blessings over them every service, whatever it might be. But Ahab and Jezebel were wicked. When there's wicked leadership, it certainly filters into the nation as a whole. Scripture tells us about the importance of praying for those who are in leadership. Why? Because leadership affects, effects, infects, perhaps, the whole. Sin is still the most corrupting influence in our spiritual life. Sin is still the most corrupting influence in our nation. It's not the liberals. It's not the homosexuals. It's not the republicans. And as much as everybody wants to blame Donald Trump for everything, it's not Donald Trump. It's sin. It's sin in the lives of God's people. It's sin in the lives of God's churches. It's sin in the lives of God's pastors. Sin in the lives of God's voices and evangelists in the nation. When we choose not to live for Jesus, it begins to corrupt our life. Now, we, don't, we don't use that word anymore, though. It's not popular terminology. We don't even like to talk about it. In fact, we want to just change the definition. Sin used to be a, a verb, an action, right? Well, he, this is sin. He did that. We don't even treat it like that anymore. We say that now if it's sin, or we don't use that word, we talk about diseases and we talk about disorders. Uh -huh. Somebody has a problem. They don't have a sin. Somebody has a disease. It's not a sin. Somebody has a disorder. It's not a sin. Folks, there are just some things that is clear. Sin. Amen. Drunkenness is sin. Amen. Drug addiction is sin. Amen. Premarital sex is sin. Amen. Homosexuality is sin. I never thought it'd ever be that quiet in this church at that point. <laughs> it's still sin. Amen. And it, 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 it'll always be sin. Yeah. Not every bit of time, but it's not sin. Yeah. Not every bit of time, and you can change the definition of it and call it something else, but it's not what it is. And it is what it is, it's just sin. But yet, you know, we, we just change everything to disorders you know, that are happening. I'm going to give you the simplest biblical definition I can. I think we just need some time to get back to it. <laughs> Because we are living in a culture now where a very small percentage is what we would call evangelical or Bible-believing Christians anymore. It's a very small, small part. There's many people in the nation who call themselves Christians or believers, but a very, very small portion of people, you know, that, that, that you would really refer to as what you might call born-again, you know, blood-washed, born-again Christians, according to that biblical definition. Well, what is sin? Just to clarify, according to the Scriptures, sin is first and foremost transgression of the law. In 1 John 3, 4, it says this, Whoever commits sin transgresses the law. For sin is the transgression of the law. Do you understand that? That means the law is what, this is what the Lord has said. The Lord said this is right, and the Lord says this is wrong. All right? And when you choose to ignore that, and you decide what you think is right, or what you think is wrong, that's sin. That's sin. It's a transgression of the law. In every major intersection in this county and in this city and any city and county around here, you'll come up to the stop sign and you'll come up to the red light and it turns red or the stop sign's there. You pull up to it. Take a notice when you leave the service today that almost every one of those intersections, there's a big old fat white line out in front of you. There's a stop sign and there's this big line about 18 inches, 2 feet wide and about the length of half of the intersection. It goes over and it's there. Now what do you think it's there for? It's therefore to let you know if you're going to stop, like the law says stop, then you stop not on the line, not beyond the line, but behind the line. That says stop, and you say where? Right there. <laughs> Red light, stop, where? Right there. <laughs> not, not on it. Don't elbow your husband. <laughs> not over it. Don't elbow anybody except yourself. But where? Behind it. Now, what happens if I go over it, even if I stop? 
But I stopped where I thought I should stop, not where the law says stop. That's what the Bible uses, a word like this. You read it, it's hard. See if you can get it down. Transgress. Yeah. You just transgressed. Uh -huh. Trans means to carry a cross. You, you crossed the line. You use that term, don't cross the line. I told your kids that, right? There's a line, don't cross that line. You cross the line. Now, the Bible says God has laid out certain things that are wrong, that are sins. This is it. And if you do those things that God has said not to do, that's to transgress. That's what sin is. Also, it's described as simply as rebellion against God. Because it's not the law necessarily. It's God. God's the one who said those things. God's gave, he's the one who gave us this word. He's the one who gave us these, these, these lines. And by the way, lest you don't understand, God gave you those lines for your protection. Amen. He gave those lines to guard you and to keep you safe, all right? So when you cross those lines, it's not because God's trying to be mean. I don't like you if you put a barrier there. No, God's saying, you step out there and you're run over. That's right. Mm -hmm. Look both ways. There's a line there. So ultimately, it's not that necessarily something's written. It's, it's what God has said. David the psalmist prayed in Psalm 71, Lord, against you and you only have I sinned. This he sinned against others, but ultimately what he's saying, it all is bellows down if I just obeyed you, God. Yeah. These other things I wouldn't have done. I wouldn't have killed him. I wouldn't have slept with her. I wouldn't because I, I sinned against you. Are you with me? Yeah. The third definition would be this. It's omission. James puts it this way in chapter 4. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. It wasn't so hard to say, was it? Yeah. <laughs> it's sin. In other words, there are things that you know you're supposed to be doing, but you're not doing. Just as much as you know the things you're not doing, <laughs> and you're doing, there's some things that you're not supposed to be doing, and those are things, you know, that you're lifting up. Those are sins of omission that you just, you're just not doing what God told you to do. That's another example. But let me boil this down to the simplest version of what the Scripture tells us. Ultimately, sin is unbelief. Because all these words come from God. Hebrews says, take heed, brethren. Listen carefully. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you... An evil, an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. What's it saying? It says, if I don't heed what God says and I don't do what God says, now this may be earth-shaking to the modern church today, but if I don't heed what God says and I don't do what God says, what have I done? I've departed from the living God. Well, we don't believe that. We believe that we can ignore God and still walk with God. We believe we can ignore God and still live for God. We believe we can abjectly disobey God and still love God. That's not in the Bible. It's just, it doesn't work that way. So this is why revival needs to come, so we get our thinking back right, and we get our understanding of theology and of Scripture right. But ultimately, the biggest sin of all sin, this is the sin that will send you to hell, by the way, is unbelief. He that believeth on him, Jesus said, is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already, but he that has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. In other words, Jesus said, there's really only one way to get in heaven, and that's by putting your faith in me, Amen. God's Son. And if you don't do that, then that's the ultimate sin. You reject Jesus. You reject God. You don't accept his plan, you, his person, his, his salvation, his precious blood that's been shed for you. You don't accept that, that's unbelief. You disregard it. You say, I don't want it. So it's sin that creates this corrupting influence in our life. It corrupts our families. It'll corrupt our church. It corrupts our businesses. It corrupts our walk. We choose first and foremost to give honor and to give glory to God in all things. And we choose not to do that. We open the door for every kind of chaos in our life. What else is enemy of revival? Confusion. You see it in Ahab's life. Because when he comes to see Elijah, he says, And Ahab said unto him, Oh, you're the, big, you're the big troublemaker. You're the trouble of Israel. And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house, and that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed Baal. <coughs> Can you imagine somebody going up to the White House and telling the president that? Mm -hmm. And there are people in our government today who really believe the main problem with America is Christians. The narrow-minded of people who claim to know truth is creating all these problems. And if we didn't have these people held up these standards, then we wouldn't have all these issues. They're just divisive, they're troublemakers, and they're just ridiculous. We don't understand. We're so confused and we're so defeated. We're so quick to blame everybody. We want to blame the new religious right. We want to blame the Catholics. We want to blame the Baptists. We want to blame the politicians. 
but where the blame needs to be laid for revival comes back to the church. We lay it at our door. We need to be right with God. We need to be whole before the Lord. We need to be what God's called us to be. I love what it says in the book of Daniel. Daniel writes, this matter is by decree of the watchers and the demand by the word of the holy ones to the intent that the living may know the most high God rules in the kingdom again of men, and he will give to it whomever he will, and he sets up over it the basest of men. God says, listen, there are going to be times in the nation's system I'm going to rise up base people to be the leaders. Why, why does that happen? <laughs> the Bible tells us sin's a reproach to any nation because the nation gets so filled with the sin, ultimately it has to come to a peak somewhere. Sin is still a reproach in a nation. Sin is still a reproach in a church. Sin is still a reproach in my life. Sin is still a reproach in your life. So what do we do about it? We quit blaming everybody for my issues. Well, if, if they weren't that way, I wouldn't be this way. If she didn't say that, I wouldn't say this. Hey, it doesn't matter what she Amen. says. What comes out of your mouth is your responsibility. Right. What comes out of your life, how you live your life, you're responsible Amen. for that. You can't blame your mother. Amen. You can't blame your father. You can't blame your race. You can't blame another race. You just say, I am what I am because I, I've made the choices I've made in my life. I'll seek to make righteous choices. Don't be so confused because this whole issue that, of corruption has a tendency to lead to confusion. Let's not be confused. We understand what the real problem is. But also understand another reason why revival doesn't come so often is the same reason it was there. There were competitors. In First Kings it says, And Elijah said to the people, I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. And he talks about, and he makes this challenge, and you put your altar, and you build it, and you put a little fire under it, and I'll have an altar over here that I'll prepare, and we'll see which God answers by fire. You know, I, I told this, this, this morning in, in the first service, I said, you know, I've read this story a thousand times, preached it for a hundred times from these different passages, and studying through Elijah and his life and the character of revival. But I've never even really paid notice before that he says, when you build your altar, we want the God to answer from fire from heaven... That's the God we're going to serve. And everybody agrees to that, that component, right? Mm -hmm. But he said, I'll give you guys a little cheat here. Mm -hmm. You can start a little fire under yours. <laughs> I'll give you a little help. Prepare your altar. Cut your animal up, however the sacrifice calls for it with all you Balaamites. And decide what you're going to do. And uh, hey, put a little fire under it to start with. And they're glad to do it. Do you realize we still have competitors for revival in our nation? We're still filling our nation up, you know, with every kind of... And thank God for religious freedom. It's all part of what we are as Americans. But ultimately, with God, there's just one way. And God gives us the right to make, if we're going to make that decision, to, to receive and to trust and believe that one way. <coughs> but men's hearts are free to make that decision if they choose not to. They can come up with whatever kind of system of religion they desire to, and you don't have to leave it up to many men very long at a time to come up with a thousand different systems of religion. Mm -hmm. You see Elijah on Mount Carmel. You see him standing there all by himself. You see the 450 prophets of Baal. You see the 450 prophets of Asher, or 400 of them. There were 850 pagan leaders over there. 450 are going to participate directly in this. All of them, before it's all done, are going to die. That's right. They're all going to be judged. So God will let you choose to live in error, but understand you're going to pay the price for choosing that life. That's right. Right. Because God is going to be faithful to tell you what the truth is and to lead you into truth. But most men do not want the truth. Most people don't want the truth. And it's not because they're so brilliant and so wise and so educated and so knowledgeable. It's because they're cowards. They don't want to surrender. They don't want to give their life to God. They don't want to let God be number one in their life. They don't want Jesus to be the Lord of their life. They want their way. And so they'll, they'll embrace something that will let them... In, have what they want and still kind of solve and, and soothe their conscience to some degree by saying, I believe in God. I guess part of the uniqueness about this whole story is I was just kind of meditating on this week was that here's Elijah and here's all these false prophets. Good for Elijah. He's not over there in that circle of 850 un unbelieving false leaders of people, 850 men who will be responsible for God eternity for leading thousands of people to eternity in hell. He's not over there trying to start a prayer meeting and ecumenical-based gathering. Oh, you know, we just all ought to get along, brothers. Let's have a prayer meeting together. It doesn't matter what you believe. It doesn't matter what you think. Folks, it matters what you believe. Especially if you're going to stand up and tell other people what to believe. 
You're responsible, not only for you, but for what everybody you mislead or everybody you lead correctly. Your responsibility to be a truth teller, a truth speaker, and to be bold. Amen. You're not going to go over there. There's so many priests today just trying to get these little ecumenical meetings going. Let's just embrace hands with the imams and with the Buddhists and with the priests over there that's doing that. Hey, somebody needs to say, oh, guys, bless their heart. They need to come to Christ. They need to be saved. I will pray for them, but we ain't got anything in common to pray together. Amen. I'm not going to bow my head in unison with them to whatever they're bowing their head to. I only bow my knee and my head to the Lord Jesus Christ and to my Heavenly Father. I, I, I know that this, I, let me tell you, I can watch your faces now. And I can see short-circuiting going on in your brain. Because <laughs> you've been said such a load of political correctness, you don't get truth left half the time. Amen, right? But Brother Joe, don't you think we ought to love the Muslims? Who said I didn't? Try. Come on. Who said God doesn't? Try. But do I agree? Will I embrace? No. Amen. Any more than I will. And this may be rough for even more of you. Even, even though I won't even do that with the Catholics. Come on. Amen. I don't believe the church saves anybody. I believe Jesus only Amen. saves. Right. So, there are some lines that we draw. We love everybody. I'll reach out. I'll encourage. I'll pray for them. But I'm not going to have a joint prayer meeting with them. Amen. Unless they want to invite me to speak. <laughs> Be glad to. Hallelujah. And I want you to know, these guys are, and it's, it's much like this world we're living in today, these false prophets, that they're organized, they're mobilized, and multiple, they're demonized. Amen. And they're aggressively contesting the gospel. <laughs> yeah. As it is today in the same world we're living in. They'll put up with any kind of little ecumenical pastor that wants to come in, as long as he doesn't stand in that meeting and say, there's really only one way to salvation, and his name is Jesus. There's really no other name under heaven whereby a man must be saved, and it's the name of Jesus. The Bible says, he that believeth not on the Lord Jesus Christ is condemned already. That's when people stop and listen. They don't like that. What, why don't they like it? Because you just told them they're all going to hell and they don't know Jesus. Amen. <laughs> I mean, isn't that what you just said? Amen. I mean, it's easy to say amen to here. Say amen to it at work. See what happens. Yeah. Say amen to it in public school. See what happens. Yeah. It gets you in trouble quick. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, Obadiah knows this. That's why he said, oh, you're going to to kill me. You're going to kill me. You're going to kill me. I lose my job. I got no money. I go find another church. I had preachers tell me that before. I can't preach like that. They'll fire me. And I said, hey, I've been thrown into better places. <laughs> <laughs> that's where you're at. The, the revival needs to take place. Yes. Amen. God needs to do something. Amen. Those are the those are the enemies. Corruption, compromise, confusion, competition for truth and life. Jesus is the answer. So Elijah pulls it all out and says, Hey guys, here what, here's what we're gonna do. And he said, let's take a let me just get your attention. Let's have this little contest here. You build an altar, I build an altar. Let's put a start with a little fire. We won't put a fire in here. And the God that answers from heaven by fire, that's the God who will serve. And I'm sure half of them looked around to see if anybody else was going to say yes first. Oh, he said, okay, yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, we'll do that. And then it happens, which brings us to this next part, which we call the elements of revival. Because it begins to take place with the elements of revival. Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. And with those stones, he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around it large enough to hold two measures of seed. It says, he arranged the wood and cut the oxen pieces, laid it on the wood, and he said, fill the four pitchers with water, and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time, and they did it a second time. And he said, do it a third time. They did it a third time. The water also flowed around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Isn't it amazing? He gets there, there's obviously this old altar there already. That's why he called the meeting there. And it's made of 12 stones, representing the 12 tribes of Israel. And he starts to, by taking those 12 stones and rebuilding the altar. For revival to come, there has to be that, 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 that solidarity. We'll just call it unity. There's these 12 stones that are put back into place. Unity. Now, we have, those of you who've been around this church for any length of time, we probably have, 
I know a lot of churches and all churches, so I'll say this in, in that context. We have the sweetest fellowship I know of anywhere. Amen. I mean, there's such a spirit of unity in our church. It's just it's like nothing I've never seen before. But just because we get along doesn't mean we have biblical unity. We can all agree. I mean, it's one thing we all perhaps like each other for the most part. <laughs> You're mature enough to, to tolerate the other brother, right? To put up with each other, somebody's shenanigans, as we called it, or they, you know, just, that's just Robert, he's weird. You can do that, all right? You can get over that. But that's not really unity. That's love. Unity here in regard to Scripture, there's that passage in Ephesians where he talks about the unity of the Spirit, you know, that we, we're, we come together and we, we're unified as the body of Christ, we're responding by the gifts that God's given us as apostles, prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. What's that for? For the perfecting of the saints, the works of the ministry, the building of the body of Christ, attaining the unity of the faith, the knowledge of the Son of God to full-grown man, the measure uh, of the stature of the fullness of Christ. What's he saying there's unity based upon an objective. There's unity that has the goal. There's unity that, that propels each of us. It's not that we just get along. It's that we're getting along for the same purpose. There's a goal we have together. It's to build the body of Christ. We have a goal, and that's to make disciples. We have a goal to reach a lost world. We have a, gro a goal to disciple the saints. We, we have a, That's unity. So you may be getting along, but you really may not have unity. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. You can get along with everybody, but if church is just something you do, you're missing this whole unity issue. You say, sure. well, I do it on Sundays, and my family's been doing that, and that's just a good habit we have. Well, good for you. That's nice, but hey, there's a whole lot more to it than coming. Amen. That's right. We're part of something. Amen. We're part of something bigger than us. Amen. We're part of the kingdom of God. Yes. We're part of the family of God. We're part of God's purpose and will for these last days and that we're in on the planet. We're part of something big. And every one of us needs to be discovering, as he says in Ephesians 4, that place in that, in, in that whole program of what God is doing, of making us more like Jesus and reaching a lost world so that they become like Jesus. Amen. And so we're getting along for a purpose. We're loving for a reason. That's so we can do what God's called us to do. Unity in Christ. That's usually one of those critical early warning systems in a church is when people just start getting disgruntled and won't put up with each other anymore. And you know they've gotten off track long ago before that ever started. Right. Mm -hmm. Unity. And then watch what he does. Another critical element of this is separation. All right? He, he makes it very clear. I'm not going to use your altar, and you're not going to use mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to build. I'm not going to put my sacrifice on your altar. That's all too often what happens in the church today. We're trying to be too much like the world. Instead of, instead of showing the distinctiveness that we are unique and we're separate, we're not like the world at all. That we're holy. And that's what that word literally means. Separate and holy. Different. There's nothing like God. There's nothing like the gospel. There's nothing like the truth. And that's what we want to be a part of. So he says, you go do what you're going to do. And we'll see how successful it is. We'll see if God answers. And this is what we're going to do. And we're going to fill this. We're going to, we're going to build it. And we're going to put the altar on it. The wood's going to be there. And then we're going to douse it with water. Mm -hmm. What? It's not fair. You told them they could have some fire. Mm -hmm. And you want the fire from heaven. I think we can get a little fire going on bottom's way to do this. Like, <laughs> take a little sneeze. Y'all just bear with me. Just trying to share my heart here. <sighs> I was sheetrock dust is killing me around here these days. And so they, they separate their altar. It's unique. Listen, one thing about Believer's Fellowship, it should be unique. Yes. It ought to be different. It ought to be a place where people, they, they, they're going to know when they come to Believer's Fellowship, oh man, those people are going to hold you to the feet to the fire. They're going to tell you about Jesus, and they're going to tell you the truth, and they're going to be honest with you about the Word of God. They're not out there just trying to build numbers. They're out there building the kingdom. Amen. They're out there for the glory of God. They're out there, and they're going to preach the truth. They're going to do it in love. <coughs> we're going to show mercy and grace and compassion, but we're not going to back down, Amen. and we're not going to back up, and we're not going to let up, and we're not going to give up till we get taken up. Amen. Amen. We're going to preach the truth. Now catch what happened. He says, pour water on it. The sacrifice is on the altar. That's the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit's commitment to us. Amen. Jesus sent his Son to die for you. Amen. This is why, this is why I hope you will understand that 
when we talk about all these other religions and Buddhism and Islam and all these other isms that are out there today that I really don't have a lot of tolerance. None of those, none of those leaders, none of those prophets, none of those founders died for my sin. That's right. None of those, none right. of those leaders, founders, or prophets committed themselves to the cross. None of those founders were willing to make themselves become the sacrifice and the judgment that I deserve. Jesus took on himself. Yes. Amen. Therein shows you who is real and what is real and what the truth is. The truth is in Christ Jesus. Yes. And he lays himself on the altar. But the Bible also tells us that we're part of this as well. That we are to now to be a living sacrifice. Yes. That we, are, we don't have to place ourselves on the altar to die. Someone has died for us. But what we are to do is live at the altar yes. and be there what God has called us to be by presenting ourselves. And what he does for us, he asked the people to participate at this point. You say, well, now how do you see that? He says, fill up these barrels and pour the water on them. Okay. Let me tell you, by the way, they, there, was, there was no public utility district up on Mount Carmel then. No. They didn't go over to the fire hydrant, hook up the big hose, and drain water. <laughs> and even if they could have, there wasn't any water. Because what's going on? Right. right? Where'd the water come from? One theologian, one commentary, said, well, I'm sure that Elijah sent the people down with ox carts and filled the barrels up and brought them back up the mountain. Uh, I don't think we have time for that. I've been in Mount Carmel in the general vicinity where this takes place. Uh, if I had a pickup, I couldn't get down there and back up in town. Uh -huh. Much less an ox cart. He most likely took it from everybody who was there. Remember, many, many people gathered for this event. And I'm sure that they had to come in a big line and start pouring their water into the barrels so that they could be poured upon the sacrifice. And most of them were Baptists. You say, how do you know that? It took them three times to get all the water they needed. <laughs> <laughs> had to take up three offerings. <laughs> do it again, do it again, do it again. Where else would they get the water? Listen, the most precious thing in the time was the water. And they're all making a commitment to it. So there's God's commitment to this. There's also ours. Yes. There has to be commitment on our part. And when revival comes, there will be. There won't be this little, you know, penny pinching attitude towards the gospel. Well, I don't have enough time to go help. I don't have enough money to go help. Or I don't have enough spiritual gifts to go help. That's all a bunch of baloney. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to get correct here. Political correct. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's excuses. Yes. It's just searching for them. I just really don't have what it takes. There's something we can all do. Yeah. And we best discover what that is and do our part in being what God's called us to be. The, the, the next element is number four and five of this. One is faith. And you can't get around this. Hmm. This is the beauty of, of the, what Elijah's doing. He's clearly making this an act of faith. There's no way fire and water work together unless God's in it, right? right. There's just no way. And I'm sure the people are going nuts. He said, you want us to serve God. You want God to answer by fire. Spit pouring the water on it. You're just making things worse. Don't be stupid. Usually when people tell me, don't be stupid, that's a pretty good sign I'm really on to something good. <laughs> All right, it's coming from religious people. I'm doing, yeah. doing God's business. I'm just stupid. Don't do that. Mm -hmm. Don't be stupid. Watch what God does, though. I, I told Kevin, that came up with a really, really good little acronym that I'm kind of stuck in my brain now for, for F-A-I-P-H, faith. I said, F is, is, is forget. A is about. And Jimmy, you love acronyms to write this down there. I is impossible. Forget about impossible. T is trust. H is M. Forget about impossible. Trust him. Amen. Don't be afraid of impossible. <laughs> trust him. So I'm in an impossible situation. When you're in a good situation, don't forget the last two words. What are they? Trust, trust him. him. You what? Trust, trust him. I can't hear you. Trust, trust him. him. Trust him. That's what we do. Trust God right now. Well, you, 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 you say, you're like, oh, God, they just kill me. They just kill me. This ain't going to work. I'm going to die here. It's not going to work. <laughs> Don't you know who I am? <laughs> Faith. Yes. He wraps it up with the simplest but yet most profound part of it. Elijah prayed. Yes. It's not God. It's not a little long prayers in the Bible. It's just simply praying, God, I pray you answer by fire. I pray, I pray you show these people I've only done this because you told me to do this. And I'm praying. And all of a sudden, fire doesn't come from underneath. Fire <coughs> comes from above. And not only does it consume the sacrifice, it consumes the wood. Mm -hmm. It sucks up all the water. It consumes everything that is there. 
manifest the evidence of revival in the fireplace. Now put this word, the immutable God will move in judgment or grace. You see what do you mean? Well, the word immutable, and we've used this terminology before, simply means it's, you know, it's, it's, God's always the same. God, God is forever the same. He is the eternal I am. All right? God never changes. God didn't vacillate. God didn't change his opinion. You know, there's some popular ideas in theology today that God's changing his mind still and formulating his opinions based on the evolution of the human culture. Hogwarts. Ridiculous. God's word makes it very clear that he doesn't change. He is the same yesterday, today, and that's it. That's what the word immutable means. In other words, God is for what he has always been for. The word of the Lord is so. That God is against everything he's always been against. And that God is light. And the truth about this immutable light of God is it will always manifest itself. And God is going to manifest himself in every one of our lives in one of two ways. This is what I put on the screen. It's going to be in judgment or it will be in grace. <coughs> Mark it down. Now, somehow, in our little puny pea brains, we've come up with an idea that says, well, I, I can live any way I want to and God's going to manifest himself in grace. That's just the grace of God. No, it's not the grace of God. That's just stupid. <laughs> God's told you how to experience his grace. God's shown you the pathway to peace. God's shown you that the, the, the cross is the answer for all of us. We come to Jesus Christ. We surrender our life. And in finding the cross and in finding Christ, we find grace and we find deliverance and we find freedom. We put our faith with he that believeth is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned, condemned already. Do so you understand? It's, it's well, how are we going to see God show up? How will God show up at Believer's Fellowship? How will God show up in my family? How will God show up in my home? He's going to show up. God has made it very clear. As the world wraps up and the ages end, He's going to manifest Himself in particular ways. He's talking about in Scripture. We're following the, the, the chronological events of, of end times. We know that the next big event will be the taking away of the church and the beginning of the, uh, of the tribulation. It's going to be a time of great judgment where God says, I'm going to manifest myself in great judgment in, the, in this world, and it's going to be in, right in the midst of Israel. And I'm going to use that great judgment to bring them to repentance and to faith. All right? My fire is going to fall, but it's not going to be something we're going to warm our feet by. Amen. It's not going to be something we warm the house with or cook our meal with. This is a judgment fire. Yeah. Yeah. And as much as this world and pastors and preachers and churches do not like to... Deal with this issue of heaven and hell and judgment. Oh, we'll talk about heaven. We'll write books on it. Nobody's writing anything about hell. Yeah. Not a popular seller, is it? No, it's not. We'll talk about angels, not demons. Mm -hmm. But understand, much if we don't discuss it, it's still going to be reality. Amen. How are we, as individuals, going to experience the immutable God in our life when he manifests his presence in real ways? Will it be in judgment or will it be in grace? Well, I think God's made it very clear throughout Scripture. He prefers the grace. And for that to happen, my sin had to be judged. And so he sent his son to judge my sin there. So that I wouldn't have to experience it. You know, Satan throws everything he can at all of us at all times, doesn't he? Sometimes he just feels relentless. Then you add that to the other competitors of false religions and false ideas and Paul said, don't be deceived by vain traditions of men or by the philosophies of men, by popular culture. Don't be deceived by those things. Those are things that are just constantly warring against our souls. Yeah. Then you add to the fight that sometimes I just cooperate with it. I want to be like that. So do you. <laughs> sometimes we just give in. Sometimes we just let go. Sometimes we just choose not to obey God. So there's a war that's taking place. But praise God for mercy and grace because I can come back to Christ and I can experience revival in my life. And I can't see God move in a real way. Yes. How do you want God to move in your life? How do you want God to move in your home? More importantly, hey, it's equally important. How do you want God to move in our church? Amen. Yes. Amen. I want to move in grace. And I believe in these days and weeks and months ahead, the years that he gives them to us, that we can see God do some incredible things. We can, do, we can see God blow our minds if we'll choose to be unified in the purposes of revival and commitment to Jesus that he's called us to. That we choose to be by faith, because of the grace of God, choose to be what God's called you to be. I don't know what it is in your own heart and life. I'm not God. He is. 
but he knows and you know. Uh, you know, it's not really a big guessing game when it comes down to knowing what God's up to in my life. I pretty much got a good handle on it, and so do you, if you just be honest. You say, well, what is it? He's trying to make you like Jesus. Yeah. He wants you to be more like Christ. He wants Christ to be seen. He wants you to be filled with the Spirit. He wants you to walk in that spirit. He wants you to live victoriously. He wants you to exceed in your spiritual walk in life. He wants you to walk in fellowship with Him. He wants you to know His voice. He wants you to know His nearness. He wants you to experience His presence in your life. That's what God's up to. We're going to cooperate with that, or we're just going to start looking for other answers. Well, the other answers are not answers. It's more confusion. Today, the Holy Spirit is speaking to your heart about revival in your own life on a very personal level. Would you just surrender to Him? Would you just say yes to Jesus? Would you just let the Lord do it? Whether, whether you're watching on our live broadcast or downstairs or in this room, it's a matter of you just connecting right now with the Lord and saying, hey, I don't want to run from you and I don't want to ignore you. I want you to be God in my life. Hallelujah. I want you to be God in my heart. And then let him. <coughs> let him. If you're here without Christ today, it's a simple start. The Bible says, don't be removed from the simplicity which is in Christ. It's very simple. You, you move to Jesus. You trust in Him. You turn from yourself. You turn to the Savior. That's what faith and repentance all involve. No to me, yes to, he, to Thee. No to me, yes to You, Jesus. Would you do that today? If you've never done that before, don't let anything stop you. It's a matter of simply, the Bible says, call on the name of the Lord. Call on Him today. Turn from yourself. Don't put your reliance in your abilities, your efforts your intelligence, or anything else, put your faith in Jesus Christ to save you. He will save you. And He'll get you all the way to heaven. He'll carry you there. He'll give you what you need. He'll give you His Spirit. He'll give you His Word. He'll give you His promises. He'll give you His presence. What more could you ask for? If you know the Lord and things aren't right with God, well, 1 John 1, 9 was penned for that, wasn't it? If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. Would you allow the Lord to do that in your life today? Would you confess those things to Him? And then lastly, folks, perhaps you've been looking for a place that you can belong, a place that you can fellowship, a place that you can use your spiritual gifts. If the Lord's leading you to this place, would you be open to say yes to the Lord today and come be a part of this church? So how do you do that? Well, one is pretty simple. You have to know Jesus. Before you can join this church, you have to join Jesus. Uh, know Him as your Lord and Savior. Follow them. Be committed to the Word of God. Say, I want to live for Christ. Come be a part of what God's doing here. Let us rejoice with you. Share that with our church family. That I want to be a part of what God's doing. Let me share it with them. Let's pray together. Let's stand. Father, we, we long for a day in, in our lives that we can point to and say, that was the moment when the fire fell. When you did that great work. When you manifest your life and your presence and your grace in our lives. I ask you, Father, today, as you look through this room and you see our hearts and you know our lives, that you would speak to us, Lord, what we need to hear. You would say to us what we need to understand. You have a very unique way, Holy Spirit, of speaking to each and every one of us in just the way we clearly know what you want. I pray that there be no confusion there. You speak clearly. I pray, Father, for this time of invitation. Lord, that we get our hearts right if we need to get right. We get our lives right. We respond to you. In the name of Jesus. With our heads bowed just for a moment. If you're here without Christ, I ask you right now just to open your heart to Jesus. Say, Lord, come into my life. I turn from myself and I trust you as my Lord and Savior. And I ask you to take over in me. I receive your gift of life. Just tell him, I repent of my sins. And I turn to you today. Do that today. Right there we go. And then come. There's several men here in this altar. I'd love to pray with you personally. Come, let us, let us rejoice with you in your decision. If you're looking for a church home, come to any one of these men that are up here and say, listen, I want to be a part of what God's doing here. If you want somebody to pray with you, why don't you come, we'll pray with you. If you want to come, just find it. Even though it's, it's a little crowded, that's no problem. You come anyway. You come find a place to kneel and pray here, around the altar somewhere. If you can't kneel, then just stand somewhere and pray. And let's, let's just take this time and do business with God. He's present. He's here. Don't miss this opportunity. You come as we worship the Lord, as we sing this song of praise. Why don't you step out? You come do what the Lord is telling you to do. You come. In Jesus' name, come.
something so supernatural and incredible you're letting us be a part of it lock us into this lord give us your heart give us your mind give us your passion and all these things that we may be someone that's usable father someone you can touch and minister through in this dark time be glorified with us your people in jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. somebody say amen, amen. Hallelujah.